But as I mentioned on the email, um, I wanted to kind of tell you, uh, you all, since we talked about it before I left, uh, what it was like um, traveling during the pandemic and, and, and kind of what it was like for us down there. Um, and uh, I know that numerous people on this call, either a couple of people were there, and John was there and Catherine was there. Um, I know Chris, you were there in the past, we've got some other people. So um, it's, you know, going down there is great. It's uh, a lot of fun. Um, we were, weren't sure what to expect on this trip because uh, it was so different in that they hadn't had any tourists down in the area in so long that we weren't sure how that was gonna affect us. Uh, I'll start with, before I even get into that, let me talk about the travel and what it was like. So it was international travel uh, flying from the, uh, from the US into Costa Rica. And luckily right before we left on the trip, Costa Rica changed the uh, policy so you, they didn't require you to get a COVID test within uh, 72 hours of flying. Although all of us, and I recommended all of us do, and everybody did get a COVID test and tested negative, which was kind of nice for us all to know that in advance. Um, but it meant that it was easier to travel in because all of us were stressed out about the 72 hours because you had to be tested within 72 hours, but you also had, had to have your results back to be able to give it to them, which, as you guys know, sometimes your results are within 24 hours and sometimes it's longer than 72 hours. So that, that added stress initially. And when they backed off on that requirement, it made it easier for us. Um, we all got tested anyway, but it was just a less, less stress. Um, they are requiring insurance, um, which is beyond your standard travel insurance and in that they wanna include, they wanna make sure that everybody has uh, um, two, enough, $2,000 worth of hotel credit. So if you get COVID down there and you have to quarantine, or if you have a quarantine for any reason, the government's not putting your bill for your hotel room. So everybody had insurance, which was actually pretty inexpensive to get. And then they give you a QR code. And, and before you even, I even left from San Francisco airport, they required that I showed them that QR code. So, um, so they had that requirement and that code was shown again in Houston on my connection which by the way, my connection was canceled. We got on the plane, I was sitting on the plane. And then they said, um, the weather in Costa Rica was giving them fits. So they canceled all the evening flights. So I spent the night in Houston. Um, that was interesting even there um, at the, I stayed at the Marriott property. And you know, the remote controls, as you guys all know, are notorious for being the most dirtiest piece of a hotel room. And it was sealed in a plastic bag saying it had been sanitized and everything. Um, but you know, that was really the only, um, there wasn't a whole lot of changes other than of course the restaurant not being open or whatever. But um, we got to Costa Rica, going through um, the immigration process wasn't all that much different um, other than um, uh, you know, showing the QR code uh, that we had insurance. And so, um, and, and unfortunately because all the flights were canceled, I came in at a really busy time. It took like an hour and a half to get through immigration. Everybody else who came in had almost a zero line, just went straight through. Um, but I went down a couple of days early, thank goodness, um, to, to kind of test the system for everybody. So I was sending emails to the group uh, in advance, like, hey, I'm down here. Here's what I saw. Here's what you should do. Um, and, uh, and that worked out really well. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, I stayed in San Jose, Costa Rica for three nights. Three nights or two nights? I guess it was, I think it was three. Um, two nights in, the, in downtown and then one night with the group at, at the Doubletree, but two nights at the Marriott residence in, in San Jose, Costa Rica, and um, really interesting, their protocol. So when I arrived at the, uh, the hotel, they sprayed my luggage down with an antiseptic spray. I had to step on um, a antiseptic, uh, like carpeted uh, uh, liquid, and that they, they you know, wanted you to wash your hands, of course, with uh, you know, Purell type of stuff. Um, that was just to get into the hotel. And then once you're in the hotel, they had additional things. And of course, no restaurants and stuff were open there or um, you could eat in a room. But, but what I saw, the way they were handling it, obviously everybody there was wearing face masks. Um, and they do have, they had a curfew. Uh, we, have, we now have a curfew here in California. But um, they had a curfew even back then. They had one where they um, were required people to be back in at home. I believe it was nine o'clock at night on uh, weekends and 10 o'clock at night on weekdays, I believe that's what it was. 
um, until five in the morning. So they they actually were uh, ahead of the curve um, and doing things I think better than we are doing it here in the in the states or at least in California. Um, and I know in places uh, I know I saw that Sue Carter joined from Australia, and I know the entire country of Australia had eight cases the other day. Um, you know, we have that probably in my neighborhood. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not that bad, but it's pretty bad. And so um, it was good to see that the people in Costa Rica took it seriously and handled it correctly. Um, so that was, that was a good thing to, to have to know. And then um, I ended up joining up with our group. I went and shot uh, and investigated some new areas of Costa Rica for future trips. Um, and I'll show you some of the images from that. And then, um, and then end up going to the Doubletree and meeting up with our group and having dinner where we all met each other. And then we flew into the rainforest the next day. And I will tell you that uh, being in the rainforest uh, is the ultimate in social distancing because there's no one around. It was really, it was the five of us uh, plus me, so six. We had the resort pretty much to ourselves almost the entire time. So we had our own uh, um, you know, area to eat because the dining room was just us. Uh, we, there was one other couple, honeymoon uh, couple that was there for a couple of nights. Other than that, I think three nights. And the rest of the time we were on our own pretty much. And, um, and uh, the whole resort was ours. We had our own swimming pool, our own bar, our own restaurant, our, and, uh, and of course our own guide. And the good thing was because everybody got tested, we could kind of be within our own bubble. And I think we all felt very safe uh, within the first couple of days that, that this is gonna work without masks, especially when we're outside. Um, and so, uh, you know, a bit of a risk, I guess, in, you know, ultimately there was some concern on my part about, you know, is this the right thing to do? But I think um, it was the right thing to do for a lot of reasons. One, everybody stayed healthy. We all had a great time. We saw some amazing stuff, which I'll show you here. Uh, but also um, economically, we were so welcomed. And I, I know John, you, would, you felt this too, that uh, people just, we're so happy to see that we were there, um, whether it was you know, visiting certain places for an excursion. Uh, we were on the Sierpe River, which is uh, one of the river tours that we do, which is really a fun trip. And um, normally uh, we see, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 boats that are cruising up and down. They're like little pontoon boats and you, you take a tour. And there's usually tons and tons of them. And I think we saw one other boat that was going the other direction at one point. I mean, we pretty much had our own river too. Um, so the concern I had was, okay, it's either gonna be great because we're gonna see tons of wildlife or it's gonna be bad because um, the wildlife as when we got down to the resort and yes, it's uh, uh, Chris asked if it was the same place. Yes, we stayed at uh, Crocodile Bay again. And the, what they said was this a new generation of wildlife that had never seen tourism, never seen tourists, because because when we get down there, no one had been there for eight months. So a lot of the baby monkeys were born and stuff, and they'd never seen anybody. So that was kind of, I thought my first thought was, oh God, this could be horrible if we get there and we're watching, and all of a sudden all the babies are leaving, and you know, and won't you know, won't let us get their photo. As it turned out, that was not the case. Thank goodness. Um, and what we saw was an amazing breadth of, of wildlife, and I've had. Uh, a couple of people who I've shared my uh, my web link with, which I will share with you as well, and they're like, "Wow, you saw an amazing you know plethora of animals," which we did um, in a very short amount of time. So it actually worked out great. Um, but people were so happy to see us. We, we we went out to dinner one night. We so we tried to um, you know make sure that we shared the wealth. But I mean, even the people at the resort were just so happy to see us because I mean, honestly, they just opened up about five days before we got there or a week before we got there. Um, and uh, so we were really helping the economy, them. And, and the other thing that's interesting is all of us, because we you know, were having breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. And we just kept talking about the fact that it felt so good to be in at least some sense of normalcy again, uh, and that we could shoot and be creative. Um, again, we didn't have to wear masks because we were our own little pod. And like I said, even in places where you'd normally wear a mask, like you know, in the restaurant area, we didn't have to because it was just us. Um, when we were in the uh, reception area, we would wear masks, um, but it, there's only the same two people there. So uh, we felt very safe being there. And of course, the last thing we want to do is bring COVID to them once they really don't have it down in that area. So it worked out excellent. Um, and I, uh, 
we'll share with you guys here some images. Let me, uh, let's see if I can pull this off. So give me a sec here and I'm gonna see if I can share this. So bear with me here. This is always awkward moving this around. So let me see. Go to screen share. Okay. Can you guys all see this? Yes. Yep. Okay. So this is uh, this is the Quetzal. I've been just walking through some of my favorite images from the trip. This is uh, in a different area of Costa Rica. This is not in the resort where we normally stay. This is me investigating different areas for a future trip. And this is the female Quetzal, which is one of the birds that everybody wants to see when they go to Costa Rica. It's a really, uh, really cool looking beast. Uh, this is the female and this is the male. Uh, really, really pretty with long you know, tail and everything. And uh, had to get up at like 4.30 in the morning, which is 2.30 in the morning, my time, to get out there to make the drive. But it was really fun to, um, to see different areas of, of the country. And they're just really cool birds. And then, um, we went to some different areas. Um, this is uh, a resort that I'm, uh, an, another smaller resort that I'm looking at on a different area of the country to potentially do a birding kind of trip. And they have hummingbird um, feeders, but they actually put the, the flowers out like this one here. And this is just clipped to a little clip and they put flowers out so you can photograph the hummingbirds and uh, made for some really, really cool photo ops. This is no flash. This is just using the ambient light that's bouncing off uh, the birds to show the colors. And as you can tell, the, the colors are amazing. This one here, I just happened to catch. I was using the, uh, on this particular one, I was using the Canon R5 with the 100 to 500 lens and um, just happened to catch the interaction between these two birds that were kind of having a little argument, which I love, um, any kind of interaction like that. And then we checked out different areas where they had, um, this is actually where we were eating uh, breakfast that day. Uh, and there are some woodpeckers outside because a lot of places you go in Costa Rica, they've got bird feeders, um, you know, so you can watch the birds, which I'll talk about in a couple seconds. And this is a, a toucan, um, which I'd never seen this type of toucan before. And these guys don't, um, are not notoriously known for being down in the Osa Peninsula where we have the photo tour. It's, again, it's amazing that even in this small of a country as Costa Rica is, that the wildlife is different on the Caribbean side or the north side, north area versus the south area. So it was kind of fun to photograph uh, something different like this. And um, and I did go to a reptile area. We do this on my trip where we do macro shooting. And uh, again, even the frogs were different. So this frog looked different than the green eye, uh, the red eyed tree frog that I normally shoot. So it's kind of cool to um, to shoot that way. Believe it or not, this background, these are nocturnal animals. So I thought it'd be fun to shoot against a black backdrop. It didn't have one. So the guy that, um, one of the guys that was with me was wearing a black t-shirt. So I had him back up uh, right behind the frog and I shot against his black t-shirt for this shot. Um, another different type of frog. Actually, is that the same one? Yep, same frog. But in, you know, I really one of the things I really wanted to do on this trip is I have lots of pictures of frogs sitting. I want to get frogs in movement. So that was what I was kind of working on is trying to get something different. And this is a, called a glass frog. And they have different ones. This is the green one, but they actually do have um, ones. Actually, hold on two seconds here, guys. I just want to make sure that, um, let me just admit someone in. Uh, sorry, so this, uh, let me close that. This is a glass frog, not a clear one. They do have a glass frog that is completely see-through, which is really fun. I love the eyes of this one. This is taken with the 100 millimeter macro lens, again, on the Canon R5. And I took both the Canon R5 and the R6 with me. And um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. And if I forget, remind me. But I'll tell you about that. Because originally I brought it because the Canon R5 is weather sealed and the Canon R6 is not. Neither of that mattered down there, though. And this is... Um, one of the snakes down there. Again, this is a handler that's putting the snake down into the, the leaves on the, on a piece of wood for us to shoot. Um, and this was shot with the 100 to 500 lens, um, you know, cause I don't want to get that close with a macro lens to, to these guys, so. Another toucan and this one here, really cool. I love the mouth. It looks like it has teeth showing. Um, and so um, this is, they, you know, I always thought that whenever I saw pictures of birds in Costa Rica, that people just got lucky with these nice clean backgrounds. 
But what happens is you go to a lot of these places and they put these, these uh, you know, branches out for them to land and they'll put food over to the side so that the birds will land and eat the food and then hang out right there. So that's what this is, this is actually right by a, an area where, um, where people are, um, you know, purposely feeding them to, to get them to come in. But I love the interaction between the, the bug right in front of the bird. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, this is, uh, let me see here, where are we? Yeah, so this bird here is actually the first picture I took with our group. So we, we, we landed in, uh, in the Osa Peninsula in the rainforest around, I think it was around maybe one in the afternoon when we got to the resort. So we just sat, basically we decided to sit down and go straight to lunch. Well, right outside our window was, uh, um, they were feeding birds, they put a bunch of papayas out there, um, which, is, which kills me because their papaya is so good, I like to eat it. But they put them out there and the funny part was, we didn't even, I don't even think, John, do we even start lunch? I think we were all outside shooting before we even ate. I think um, all of us were like, oh, look at that bird. Oh, look at that one. So we all grabbed our cameras and started shooting. Um, one of the challenges of being in the rainforest is it's humid. So one of the things I told everybody is keep your cameras outside because you don't want to bring them inside because they'll fog up if you go outside to shoot. But uh, all of us went out and this was taken before we even ate lunch. So... Um, this is a couple macaw that were flying above us. Um, this is on the property as well. And I, I need to take these two birds and put them into a bluer background instead of the white sky, but this is what it truly looked like. Uh, so I left it for all of you to see that way. Um, and this is a howler monkey. Uh, they have four different types of monkeys down there. They've got howlers, uh, spider monkeys, uh, squirrel monkeys, and white-faced monkeys. Uh, the capuchins are the squirrel monkeys. but Love the eyes. And one of the things we work on when we're down there is to look for the catch light in the eyes for them to look up and uh, got some really, really nice shots. Love the, the nail showing and everything. Um, really fun to get that. So we all got these um, hanging down and basically we'd take the vehicles out and go looking for, for animals. This is on our first excursion out and uh, just saw a bunch of howlers. Love this with the baby and the mom. Uh, this is, uh, again, on that same first day out, and this is a spider monkey. Spider monkeys use their tails uh, to hang, and uh, I'd actually, this one was great because they actually posed for us. They're, one by one, they were dropping down this branch and going down into the grass, so we kind of could anticipate the movement, which was kind of fun, and um, so it's kind of fun to get this guy hanging out, and again, looking up so we can get the light into the face. This bird here, um, uh, I'm trying to remember where we shot this one. This might be at the resort, but I love the feathers. I've never seen that before. It was really, really pretty. John and Catherine, who went with us, uh, are the birders. And so they would be able to, they were the ones identifying everything as I was shooting. That's a pretty one. That's a pretty one. <laughs> but, uh, and this is on the, uh, as we we're driving, uh, you're driving along some uh, farmland. So this is a barbed fence, but there was this hawk on the fence and he was taken off. And so, uh, we all kind of opened the door and took pictures of the hawk, both on the perch and not. This is right by the swimming pool. Um, whenever I go to the pool, I pretty much almost always bring my camera with me because you just never know what's going to pop out while you're in the pool. So this is a toucan hanging out. There's a one tree there that they tend to hang out at. So that was a toucan. Uh, and this is the yellow-billed one that, was, uh, that you see down in the Osa in the rainforest there. This one here actually... Um, we, we went and visited um, one of the uh, areas where they rehabilitate animals. So this was uh, photographing a toucan in that rehab area. And uh, we were taking turns holding one of the big leaves in the background so that you didn't see the cage in the background so we can get some nice shots. So I would hold up the leaf and then when I shot someone else hold up the leaf so that I can kind of figure out what camera settings everybody should be at. And uh, so anyway, it worked out uh, well to kind of hide that. And um, this is a, in the sloth cage. These, they've got three of the two-toed sloths in there. So this is actually shot with a 100-400 lens. I think it was a 100. Hold on. It might have been a 100 500. Let me see here. I think it's the 100, 100 500. Uh, but I went in there, and, and you, you were standing really close. This is taking 175 millimeters. So standing pretty close. Uh, again, we we're trying to, uh, you know, 
good, get good clean background. So I would shoot really tight on the animals so you didn't see the cage in the background. And this is us holding that leaf in the background behind them as well, right here as well. Um, and uh, this is, uh, we had both, we had, a, you know, when we're there, they have Rosie and Sweetie and other monkeys that, uh, that were rehabilitated there, but they're still in the wild. And this is uh, Rosie with her baby and uh, really uh, so much fun to, to photograph them, um, you, know, in, in, you know, in their environment. But again, they're so habituated with people that, uh, that they're not scared of us when we're photographing. And uh, they'll even hang out and, and they, they really like John. I think uh, Sweetie did. Um, but I love that picture of the baby kind of peeking around. That's one of my favorite shots. This is her, the baby there. I should mention that all the images that uh, I took there, the toucan, the sloth, this picture, this picture and some others, um, I sent to Carol who runs this rehab area uh, for her calendar, which she just started selling yesterday, I believe. There's the baby behind mom. And this is um, in the wild. And this is uh, um, one of the macaw, the scarlet macaw. And I just love the colors. I'm always chasing these guys. They're very loud. And so uh, when I'm in my room, you can hear them when they're close by. And so uh, I want, like at all crazy hours, I'm out there trying to get a good shot of a macaw. I believe on this particular shot is when John caught me in a towel. Uh, <laughs> I, want, I was just out of the shower and I, and I think I saw monkeys in a macaw outside my room. So I just threw a towel on and started shooting. <laughs> Um, so yeah, craziness. Um, this is a, a uh, one of the iguanas that we saw, and I'm trying to remember which where. This one, I believe, was when we were out by the beach and we saw this iguana on this log. This is when we're doing our macro um, workshop, and actually, I need to probably take this little dot out. You'll see that catch light right there. That's actually an LED light reflecting in the the uh, eyes uh, of the frog, and that's uh, Dennis, our guide, holding one up. So he held one and I had some small LEDs that I would hold up. And that's what we would light these guys with. Same thing here with this tree, with this frog. And this is, as I mentioned to you earlier, I have a lot of pictures of the frogs sitting in position. So I really wanted to try to get some more of them moving. So what I actually did differently on this trip is I used the long lens. I used the 100 to 400, I believe, or maybe it was 100 or 500. Let me see if I can look that up here. Now this is a 300 millimeters. I don't remember which lens I used here. It was one of the two. I used a long lens um, as opposed to using a macro uh, for two reasons. One is I wanted to stand back and let everybody else shoot with their macro. And I, I wanted to let my the people that are on the, the tour, those guests get their shots so I could stand back and shoot from a distance. But it also kind of allowed me to shoot a little differently. So it was kind of fun. And sorry. Just met more people, sorry, joining late there. Um, this here, this is a, uh, um, a viper and uh, we did place it on this uh, flower. This, um, and it was kind of fun to see how it would slither through and uh, really cool. This is one of my favorites. I love the way that the uh, snake went and you know perfectly up through the flower and just kind of curled in at the very bottom here, but in perfect, nice resting on this one here. So that was kind of fun to, to have that shot. Although I did shoot some tighter shots like this, and I shot a tighter shot like that with the tongue sticking out. So, um, you know, this is an example where our handler is putting the snake where we want him to, and, and then we would shoot. So here's a eyelash viper, um, and, and the, the viper was, again, you know, there and placed there for us. So all of these shots, whether it's, you know, this one, this one, we're not in any danger when we're shooting the snakes. Actually, this shot's, this one I really like for a lot of reasons. One is the handler put the snake on this, this uh, log that was there. But I love the fact that this is all very natural uh, in the scene. And it had started raining at this point. So everything is wet and it's a rainforest. So that's great because it shows what it's supposed to look like. Um, but I got it with the tongue out. I really like this environment. So actually, this is one of my favorite images, um, even though it's different than what I had shot. It doesn't, it's not as dynamic as like this one, but it's more realistic. And I still love the fact that it just, you know, I don't know, everything about it just kind of works for me. 
And um, this parrot, I, you know, um, I'd never seen the parrots up close there. And it was really fun to get the shot. Um, there was a, um, it had the nut in its mouth or the fruit or whatever it was from the tree, which really makes it fun versus just a, you know, bird sitting there. So it's fun to get the colors of this, you know, with complementary colors in the fruit there. This was uh, shooting, we went to the chocolate, uh, there's a, it's not even a, a factory or a farm, it's someone's home where they grow the co cocoa and they actually hand make the chocolate there. And um, we were there and I don't know how many monkeys we had. I'm gonna guess maybe 40 or 50, I don't even know. There was a large, two large packs of, uh, of the squirrel monkeys that came in and <laughs> all of us were like watching them, how they make chocolate. And the minute the monkeys showed up, we're like, we're out. We were all like transfixed with the monkeys. And this little one had peeked through this palm frond and was looking down at us. And I just thought that was the coolest shot with it looking down, still getting catch light, getting the hands there, but just kind of, just kind of bend that leaf through so to see us and we were watching it, it was pretty funny. So we were getting all kinds of shots of these guys, um, you know, amongst the leaves, in the branches uh, and all kinds of goodies. Um, and then they were jumping over us. And so I literally went, you know, they tend to follow each other, as I mentioned earlier. So I went underneath them as they were jumping and stood <laughs> right underneath them and just pointed up at ISO 3200, which gave me, I think, uh, it, oh, actually, I could have brought the ISO down because I was at 8,000th of a second. Um, but anyway, uh, I was just pointing straight up and shooting and hoping to get a good shot and uh, got that one. I had to open the shadows in Photoshop, but it was still pretty fun to get it. I love this one because this is just a big, fat male. Um, I've never seen a squirrel monkey this heavy. And um, I asked Dennis, our guide, why is he so fat? And, and if you look at his fur, it's perfect. Uh, really clean coat. And Dennis said that the males, the heavier they are, the more attractive they are to the females, which made me happy because the way we were eating at the resort, I figured I was doing the same thing. So. And this is uh, another one of the macaw. Um, this one here was on, uh, so Dennis, our guide, his uh, grandparents, have macaw on their property. And so, as you can tell, this is uh, papaya fruit. They just put some out there and we were hoping to see some macaw there and we were very lucky that they did show up and we got some cool shots of them eating, that was fun. And, and actually we had, I think, up to four of them at one time. This is cool with the kind of the barbed um, tongue, which I'd never seen before. That was kind of cool to see that. So this trip, we did something different than I've ever done before. Um, because we were there and because no one else was around uh, and the resort was very happy that we were there, they decided to give us a free excursion and surprise us. So they um, had us get up at oh, dark 30. I think we got up at like five in the morning or 4.30. I don't remember, it was really early. We got up in the morning and went out to the beach area where they're letting, uh, there's a, an, uh, a group that captures all the turtle eggs because if they don't grab them, they'll get eaten by uh, other animals. So they're trying to, to keep the uh, species alive. So they would grab all the eggs and um, they had this enclosed area, well, semi-enclosed area to protect them. And every day they let about a, you know what, as many eggs as they had. So they had about 100 eggs that day and they let them go. And this is the trails of all of them. So what they did is they drew a line for us on each side kind of going out and saying, okay, stay away from this area so the turtles can go into the ocean. And we kind of laid down on the ground and we were shooting. This is shot from behind the bucket that they let loose. And this is shot as they entered the water. This is a, I try to, a fairly slow shutter because I want to get some of the motion of the water and freeze the turtle who is about to go in. So all these turtles literally had just hatched that, that morning. And so uh, it was really fun to watch them instinctively know where to go to head into the water. Uh, this is again on the property. <laughs> this is uh, by, I think when we were eating uh, uh, breakfast one morning or lunch, it was one of the two. And we, I just, I'd never seen this colored bird before and loved it. Uh, this one here, he happened to hop up for me. So I like the little jumping motion. And I think I had another shot here. Yeah, this is without the hop, but this is a little tighter shot. So this one here, not quite as sharp as this one, but really pretty colors. I mean, just amazing to see this. And this is, um, I believe this is on the property as well. Um, 
and um, love the colors of the bird. And uh, again, the fact that it was eating these berries and getting it with the, the in that in its mouth, kind of cool. And, and they have different species of hummingbird. This is the first time I'd ever shot the brown one here. Um, and this is, I believe, uh, a female. And, um, but they have many different species and I wanted to capture that. So we, we spent a lot of time on the property just walking around and photographing, um, even though, uh, you know, we could have gone out, you didn't have to, you could just stay on the property and just shoot. This is on the property as well. Um, this is a butterfly on one of the flowers and I was laughing because it looked like two eyes and it kind of looks like earrings or something here, but it looked like a face, like a mouth here looking back at the butterfly. I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, another one of the hummingbirds, this is on the last day. Uh, I usually wake up early in the morning before we fly out and go out and shoot some more just to get something different. And just love the colors in the feathers, just amazing. Again, the brown one, something different. Settings on this in case anybody wants to know. ISO 3200 uh, at 71. So I was using with a 100 to 500 lens, I believe at uh, 400 of a second, and that gave me the blur here. These guys are very, very fast. So um, the, the amount of blur really depends on, if, you go, if I go back for a second here, you know, shutter speed, this one's at uh, 16 hundredth of a second. Still getting a little bit of blur on the edges of the wings, but okay, more so I don't know how they did this, so I don't know how you want me to put it. Oh. I think Someone needs to mute or they're asking. Um, yeah. Right, hold on, I'm gonna head back here. So give me one second. Everybody, everybody, let's see here. Mute all. Okay, I just muted everybody. So, to uh, we can. Do anybody have any questions on any of the images or anything I just showed you? Feel free to. Oh, actually, let me see. Hold on here. Let me just read and see here. First was a tiger-legged frog. Thank you, James. I need to write that down. Thank you for that. Call it uh, Arhari. That's correct, Carl. Um, so, uh, so for the birds, most of the lenses I was shooting the birds was with a 100 to 500 or 100 to 400. And um, here's the thing. With the R5 and the R6, having the eye detection, I found that that actually worked very well, even with the birds. Um, even though Canon, um, I was in contact with them the whole time I was down there, um, they would say that eye detection was really made for things like dogs and cats. But it did work very well for monkeys. Um, and it worked many times for birds, not always. Um, what I found is I was kind of surprised with the 100 to 500 lens. I thought that was going to be like the best lens ever. What I found was that two things. Because the 100 500 ends at f7.1 and the 100 400 ends at 5.6 for the rainforest where you're shooting in a lot of kind of darker setting high iso i actually thank god i brought both lenses i actually defaulted back to the 100 to 400 for many shoots there are times when i knew we we're going to be in better light like on the crpa river tour and then i would take the 100 to 500 so depending on where we're shooting i take a different lens um, I think for Africa, where you're shooting mainly on planes and a lot of open light, I think the 100, 500 would be a great lens for that. For, the, for uh, Costa Rica, um, I think the 100, 400 might be a better choice. So that was kind of interesting. The other thing I had was I did get some weird focus creeping uh, on the R5, and I believe the R6 as well, um, with the 100 to 500, where I try to focus and it just would not lock in. And I'm not talking about eyes, I'm talking about just even trying to spot focus center point on something and it'd be like, eh, 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 eh. and I was swearing like, damn it, this thing will not lock in. So I'd have to manually focus to get it close and then it would lock in. So I'm trying to get some answers from Canon as to why that was happening. Um, Cause it was, it was incredibly frustrating. I did miss some shots at times cause the damn thing just would not lock on. So um, that was kind of frustrating. And James asked, uh, do I have a target f-stop that I usually aim for? And yes, the target f-stop is wide open, as wide as I can go. So if I can shoot at f4, I'll go to f4. 5.6, I'll go to 5.6. Um, I'll usually shoot at whatever the best is I can get with that lens. 
Um, not always. If I've got multiple, <coughs> excuse me, if I do have, you know, multiple animals in a shot, then I'll, I might move to 7-1 or F8. Um, let's see here. <coughs> and John, I will let you know what Canon says when I find out. Um, Rocky wants to know, did I take any of the new um, 600 or 800 lenses? <coughs> Sorry, I did not. And the reason is there was no way um, that a lens at F11 is going to work uh, in, in the rainforest. It just won't. I mean, I was already having trouble enough at 7.1. So trying to shoot at uh, trying to shoot at F11 in a dark environment, one of the things you have to keep in mind in the rainforest is only 20% of the ambient light is coming through the canopy. So if I'm walking around the property and, and I'm just photographing um, hummingbirds on a bush, no problem, because I'm outside lots of light. But once you're into the rainforest, either old growth or new growth rainforest, more old growth than new growth, it gets really dark. So it's challenging to shoot even at 7.1. F11 would not have worked very well at all. Um, Joe wants to know if I, uh, I've never used 180 macro. I use the 100 macro and love it. Um, although 180 would work fine. Any macro, true macro lens is going to work fine down there. So um, it's not, it's not an issue. And Rocky, the name of the property, it's on my website. If you just go to my website, but the, the property I teach at, it's called Crocodile Bay. So, and there's a link, I believe, to it from my site. If you go to jeffcable.com, so, uh, go to photo tours, and then uh, there's links there. I should mention to everybody on this that um, I do have a tour in April, which I believe is full, a tour in December, which does have space. And I may shoehorn a trip in like we did with this trip that we did earlier this month. It was a last minute thing like, hey, we might be able to go in November if it's safe, and we went. I may try to do that again in February. So right now on my website, there is a placeholder there for Costa Rica trip in February. If you're interested in doing that, click on that to send me an email. I'm not doing deposits. I'm not doing any kind of written, um, you know, uh, I don't need anything to obligate you, but that way, if you're in seriously interested in doing that trip, I'm creating a list of people. So if it's safe in February, again, it really depends on COVID. If COVID is still at the height it's at now, and uh, I don't think it'd be safe for us to leave. If, if things change, uh, which I hope it does, then, then that would be different. So uh, it's a placeholder, um, but, but again, December I, I, and even April, I'm pr pretty confident on that one in December for sure. I think, especially with the vaccines coming, um, that uh, that will help. So uh, I'm fingers crossed. So that's kind of the plan on, on all of that. So anyway, with that, let's see here. Um, does it matter what time of year you go? Uh, Gene wants to know, in terms of animals, uh, birds, butterflies, flowers, yes, it does matter a little bit, um, but because they're kind of on the equator, it you know, generally is around 80 degrees and 80, 85 and humid all the time. Um, as far as wildlife, I've been there at all times of the year. Um, October tends to be a little bit rainy. So September, October is not always the best time to be there, although, I've been there at that time and you can shoot some really cool shots in the rain. So, but um, generally November through April, you're outside the rain. Uh, the rainy season starts like around July, August, September, or was it August, September, October tend to be the rainy seasons kind of, but again, I've been down there in that time and I've got some good stuff and it's a rainforest. It's going to rain. Actually um, it rained almost every day we were down there, but we never got rained out on not on one excursion. It was amazing because the rain usually comes in about sunset. So we'd be out shooting, come back, jump in the pool, get a pina colada, and then go to dinner. We'd sit dinner and the rain would start almost every night. Um, so when you look at the weather forecast, it's like rain, 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 rain. People are like, oh my God, it's going to be horrible. Nope, no problem. So um, it's, it, the wildlife is there all the time. The one thing that's different is if it is raining more, you'll see more birds on the feeders. So um, if it's raining hard, they can't easily get the fruit off the trees. So they'll come to the feeders where it's easier. Um, I've been there when there was not much rain and you get a little less of the birds. Uh, but again, there's plenty of them there in the wild. It's just a little bit less on the feeders. Um, Leslie wants to know any info on shooting the Olympics. 
So yes, there is an update on that. Um, according to my contacts at the IOC and the USOC, the Olympics are a definite go. They are gonna happen. They lit the Olympic rings on Tokyo Bay uh, four days ago. They did a test event with people in the crowds, in the stands uh, last week that went well. So uh, Japan is trying to prove to, the, to themselves and the world that they can pull this off. I do believe that, um, again, I, I, I have high hopes that the, um, the vaccines will be readily available by then and, um, and will have made a difference. I, I don't know, and I've yet to hear from my contacts, I am suspecting that they will require everybody on the Olympic grounds to have been vaccinated if we're gonna be there, but I don't know that for a fact yet. I've heard mixed things. I've heard that the IOC says they're not gonna require it, but I find that hard to believe because if I'm running the thing, I'd probably require it, but we'll see. Um, but it does look like they're gonna happen. Whether they happen with people in the stands, still TBD, um, and uh, which is, bodes well because if it happens in Tokyo, that means six months later, it'll probably happen in Beijing as well for winter. So uh, I've, I'm still planning on, on heading there. Um, I should mention on my tour page, you will see that there are two tours in February and the Costa Rica one doesn't even have an actual date yet. That's because the other trip is to Tanzania. And I don't know if that's gonna happen. So part of it is, is it safe to travel? And the other thing is, do we do Tanzania? So if we don't do Tanzania and it's safe, then we'll do Costa Rica. So that's why it's a placeholder there to kind of figure all this out. So it is literally the 2020 of scheduling, right? Where just everything's up in the air. It's, you know, and like I literally booked two events for this month for bar mitzvahs last minute, just out of the blue. So um, it's this constant ebb and flow right now of what can happen and what can't happen. I will mention that those are, you know, Zoom, bar mitzvahs over Zoom, maybe in a temple, maybe not, uh, you know, half day, no parties kind of thing. So still in that kind of craziness, but the ebb and flow is still happening. So um, going back to questions, if anybody has questions on any of the animals or images I sent, uh, you can either audibly ask or type it in, up to you guys. Or not. Well, that makes it easy. Okay, see ya. <laughs> um, well, we can, we can just, we can end early. Um, but uh, anyway, if you guys, so if there are questions and if anybody has any R5, oh, Carl, thank you, Carl. R5 or R6 for the rainforest. Um, honestly, here's what I did. I actually chose the R6 a lot because I didn't need the large file sizes of the R5. So having shot 20 megapixels and having now recently shot 45 megapixels with the R5, um, there was one day where I shot a ton. This is before I met up with the group when I was out looking at other areas. And I think I shot over 100 gig in one day. And I thought, this is just crazy. So I switched to the R6 after that. And actually, I'll be honest with you, for the money um, and the file sizes, I actually like the R6. Um, as far as weather sealing, uh, neither camera had any issues with the humidity or rain. I knew they wouldn't. Uh, I'm not putting them underwater. That would be a really bad idea. Um, so uh, I, either one would be fine. Um, and uh, I did have the, two of the adapters, which I had on my regular EF lenses. So I use the 100 to 400 EF lens. And I use the macro, the 100 millimeter macro lens. Um, and uh, both cameras were great. Um, so no issues at all with either one, which is good. Um, were all the images handheld or a tripod use? Uh, good, great question, David. So everything I shot was handheld except for the macro shots. The macro shots of the frogs were on tripod. Everything else, snakes, birds, monkeys, not all, everything else, uh, hummingbirds, everything else was all handheld. Um, and the reason is because when you're shooting macro, uh, at 100 millimeter macro lens, you don't want to be shooting at 2.8 or f4. You prefer to be shooting at like f8, f11. So you really want to be on a tripod. It's also easier for me to teach on a tripod because I can set up, I can show the shot, I can let everybody look at the back of the camera, and I can say this is what I'm getting. So it makes it easier. 
um, Gene, I didn't know there were so many types of uh, toucans. I didn't either. Um, there's actually many types that we didn't even see. And the one that I missed was the kill bill, um, which I want, wanted to get, but we didn't get any of those on this trip. I was bummed. Um, I have one from a prior trip, but I want to get a better one. So uh, well, I'll have to go back down again. That's one of the great things about going there is that every time you go, you see some different. So we didn't see any anteaters on this trip, but in the past we have. Um, but we saw, like, we saw howler monkeys. So we got done with the rehab center and we took the boat ride back from uh, back to the resort uh, for lunch. And we got off the dock and there was a bunch of howler monkeys in the trees right at the dock of the resort. So we could photograph them right there. So there's just a little bit of everything uh, going on all the time. And so, uh, but I did not know that there, there, there were that many toucans and I want to go back and see more. So um, Dave wants to know, do I shoot the 1DX Mark III? If you look behind me, it's sitting in there collecting dust right now. Um, I have not used the 1DX Mark III in, in quite a while. Um, I, I'm just spoiled by mirrorless now. I, that sounds so weird. So the 1DX Mark III is collecting dust. I don't know if that'll change either, honestly. Um, let's see. Uh, Sue wants to see some more photos. When will I be back at B and H? When will I be back? I don't know. You know, honestly, uh, I could. Sue, so I might um, be doing another virtual one through B for B and H. I don't know yet. Um, uh, it just depends on their schedule and mine. As far as going back physically to B and H, I want to go back. I want to go back to. I want to be back in New York. I miss it uh, there. So I uh, don't know when I'll be there physically, but might be doing another uh, class with them. Maybe in the next month or two. We'll see. Um, let's see here. Carl got an R6, you didn't need the 48 megapixels. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, I've shot even the 1DX Mark III, 20 megapixel camera, and I don't know that I ever need more than 20 megapixels for something. I mean, most of what I shoot, I'm not shooting for a billboard, and even if I was, it wouldn't matter because the dots on a billboard are this big. So um, I find that the R6 is just a great, I, it really surprised me because as I told all of you guys for so long, I was fixated on the R5. I think the, the one thing I wish, I wish the R6 had the CF Express cards versus the SD, because these are so much faster. It would have been nice to have that, but you can't have it all. I do, uh, I, I need to make my wish list for the R1, but uh, I gotta make a note to myself on that. But uh, um, if they come out with a professional level R camera, which I know they're going to, I hope it has two CF Express card slots. That's what I would then take down to Costa Rica next time. See, always something new to do. Um, how did the eye detect work in Costa Rica with the R6? Yeah, great. I mean, honestly, um, surprisingly well for most of the animals. There were very few animals where the eye detect did not work. And it's funny because Cannon kept saying to me when I was down there, I, I was on uh, chat with them and on texting with them. And I'm like, hey, you know, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And they go, well, you know, Jeff, our, our eye detect is only really said to work with cats and dogs and birds, certain birds. But it was working on almost everything. I'm trying to remember the one animal that it wasn't working on. It was pretty much locking in on there. Almost every shot you saw, the monkeys, stuff like that, I used eye detection and it worked great. So that was one of the reasons I don't like the 1DX Mark III is I don't have the eye detection. And when I do portrait sessions now, like I just did a portrait session last week or earlier this week, and it was a kid playing tennis. I let the camera do the focusing for me, locked in on them every time. And I could then work on other things and being creative. So uh, pretty nice. Uh, let's see here. John, Catherine wants to know if the Canon is going to come out with a 300 millimeter 2.8 for the R mount. Uh, will have a built-in teleconverter. Well, John, I don't know because uh, if, if they are, they're not going to tell me yet. Well, actually, and if they did tell me or if I had one sitting here, I wouldn't be able to show it to you or tell you. So, but here's, here's my, the answer to that. They're going to come out with a 300 for the R. They're going to come out with all the lenses for the R because I think the R is the future for Canon. So yes, I'd be shocked to see um, very many EF lenses coming out anymore. I think everything is going to be going toward the R. So sure, they'll have a 300, a 400, a 600, whatever, 500, 600. So um, John wants to know, does that mean that you won't be in the market for the rumored R5S? Nope, I will probably not be in the market for that. Uh, my guess is, I'll, well, it depends what it is, I guess. Um, but but um, I suspect that I'll be going R6 into an R1, but I don't know. 
Um, Rocky wants to know what changes uh, have I made in my focus with the R? Ah, still using back button focus. Surprisingly, I thought I wouldn't, but I am. I'm just very used to it and it still yields great results. So I'm sticking with back button. Um, I don't use live view on the back of the display ever because I don't like shooting that way. I'm still putting the camera right up to my eye with the eyepiece and shooting that way. Um, but all the focus settings that I thought that I put in my blog is exactly what I used and it worked great. So um, do you know something about the upcoming R1? Ha, <laughs> no, so there. Um, I really don't know much. I don't know anything about an R1. I, I, I've, in conversations with Canon, I know it's something that they're gonna do. Um, they won't admit that, but I can tell by the way my conversations are. But um, I will tell you guys this publicly. When an R1 comes out, I will have one before it comes out for the Olympics. I will not be able to tell you I have one until they tell me I can tell you, which generally is after they've announced it. So I probably will have one. I don't have one now, I promise you. But um, uh, a lot of times when they give me product in advance, I sign a non-disclosure agreement saying that I can't talk about it. So um, anyway, so that's kind of where that stands. Uh, do you think the uh, R1 come out before the Olympics? Yes. I, well, whether the R1 is shipping before the Olympics, uh, I don't know. Um, I do suspect I do suspect that I'll be shooting with one there. I hope. I think that they're pushing, as is our a lot of the camera companies, to have new professional level cameras for the games, because generally the Olympics is their time frame. And the One DX Mark III was given to me before the Olympics, before it was announced, I believe, so that I could test it for Tokyo. And then the games got moved out of here. I believe the minute that happened, all the camera companies have said, okay, now we have a new target. And I think that they're gonna push for that. So I, I, I suspect, I would say, I'm pretty, uh, about 85% confident that I will have one. Now, whether it's a prototype or a shipping product will be, I don't know. But I, I do think that there will be one for me to shoot with. And then the question would be, can I talk about it um, using the Olympics? And if I'm shooting with one there, they'll probably announce that there were shooting, that there are people there shooting with it. So even if it's prototype, I'll probably be able to say so. I don't know yet. So we'll, we'll see. Um, let's see here, let me see. I'm wondering what your thought is on the 5G Mark IV for landscapes and detail and R6 for wildlife and sports. Yeah, I mean, the 5G Mark IV is still a great camera. The one advantage of the R cameras is, the, is that the eye detection is so huge. I do also love the fact that I can adjust exposure comp on the fly um, and see right through, you know, in the camera with mirrorless. So I've gotten very spoiled by it. It's, it is hard to go back to the 5D or the 1DX after uh, using the, the mirrorless. So, but the 5D for landscapes is still a great camera. I mean, it's still a great camera in general. Um, for, for wildlife and sports, the R6, the R5, and even the 1DX are, are just a better camera for that. So uh, Cheryl wants to know, late to the meeting, bad. Um, what do you think of the 100, 500? Just rented it to try it with the R5. So Cheryl, um, I don't know if you caught what I was saying earlier. I like the lens. I love the focal length, but not good in low light um, because it ends at 7.1. Um, if you're shooting in low light conditions, it's gonna to be tough with that lens. Um, and I did have some focus creeping issues. So if you wanna email me separately, I'll be more than happy to answer more questions on that. Um, it is a great lens and I will say this, it is very sharp all the way to 500 millimeters. So from 100 to 500, other than the fact that it's 7.1, the thing is sharp. So um, my deciding factor for making the switch to mirrorless, uh, mainly just those things I talked about. I love the focus system. I love the eye and face detection. And I love the fact that I can look in the camera and ex make exposure changes on the fly based on what I'm seeing in the camera. Those are the, the real, uh, and, and actually the smaller size is nice. Like going to Costa Rica with two mirrorless cameras and not taking the 1DX was kind of nice because it was lighter load. So um, let's see here. Figured a good zoom setup uh, using 5D Mark III. Okay, so you're gonna share that with others if you're upgrading the zoom setup. Okay, oh. Oh, so you're using the 5D Mark III as your camera for Zoom? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, so right now I am I have the Canon 5D. Yep. And uh, I'll change to my background. Um, so you see the background 
is um, there's the camera and it's connected by um, a cable. And then you need, uh, so again, if you have a spare cannon, you can use it. Um, I'll, I'll give you, I have a light and I have a mic. Um, and I, if you wanted to, I could show you the difference, but it's easy to do. It's not that expensive and it makes a huge difference. I'll, um, I'll send the equipment that I, that I'm yeah, using. Yeah, if yeah, anyone, down, that'd be great. Yeah, if anyone is interested, uh, are you using again, the beta software from Canon? I'm sorry. Are you using yeah, it's a Canon um, EOS webcam utility yeah, software. Yeah. yeah. And that's Are, what you're on a Mac or the, uh, for Mac. And we're still waiting on Big Sur, but the one for Catalina still works. But, um, you know, I'm on Zoom six, seven hours a day. Um, so it makes a huge difference, I think, in terms of upping the sort of the professional quality. So well, anyway, I just thought maybe here's my question to you. If you're sitting on Zoom that long, how is it that you look so good and you've lost weight? I can tell you've lost weight. Well, maybe the camera's being nice to me. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the, the, you know, the issue is you have to buy, you have to get the the battery, uh, yeah, the fake battery with the cord, one. right? Because otherwise you go through batteries every hour and a half. Right. That, that and I again I'm I'm getting that cord. But anyway, it's it's not hard to do. Um and uh, if anyone wants to talk to me about it separately, I'm, I'll put in my email and awesome. let me know. Yep. Cool. Thanks for doing that. Um, Mike wants to know how I sort through all my amazing photos to decide which ones to print or post. It doesn't take forever. Mike, uh, anybody who goes with me on my trips knows I do it every night. And I show people, actually, what we did in Costa Rica was interesting. So we shot every day, but we, uh, we had a couple afternoons where we got back by one or two. So in the evenings we do critiques or I do a demo of how I call through my images or how I retouch images to make it, to finish it. So I was doing that every night. So photo mechanic um, and generally we get back and within the first hour of being back, I've already called through all my images and found my favorites. So, um, and actually I've got a, a video on how I call through images. I need to update it, but I did it at B&H. It's on my uh, website under my videos about workflow. So check that out. Um, let's see, Vicky took her R6 to Yosemite, cold, and the touch screen seemed to be freezing up. Huh. You know, uh, Vicky, I've not been in an area that's that cold yet. So, um, and I rarely rely on the touch screen for, for much, but that is interesting. I have not heard that. So it'd be interesting to see. Carl wants to know if I'm using mechanical or electronic shutter. I have not used a mechanical shutter almost at all. I use electronic first curtain, which is, I think the best one to use, I think it's the default turned on for the uh, Argus series cameras. And that's one I used almost for everything. So um, David uh, had to bug out to his next meeting. Actually, I need to bug out soon too. Uh, let's see here. How is the in-camera stabilization? Joe wants to know. Great. I mean, honestly, combination between the in-camera stabilization with the lens stabilization. I was shooting, I shot some stuff at really slow shutter speeds um, and tack sharp. Great. So good. Like amazing. I was loving it. Cool. Thank you for posting that. The uh, camera stuff. I got to take a look at that. You're not supposed to post Amazon links. You're supposed to put uh, B&H links. But you know, I'll cut you a break there, Peter. Um, did my R5 or R6 freeze for any reason? Yes. <laughs> I had my R5 freeze up one time, John, when I was down there. And um, like I went, it just wouldn't let me take any more pictures. I just quickly turned it off, pulled the battery out for a couple seconds, shoved the battery back in and went back to shooting. It was the only time that happened to me. Although um, we did have someone else on the trip that had an R5 that she had purchased and she had a couple issues as well where it froze up. So. Um, you know, I, I believe there's new firmware now, because I sent her a link to that. Um, so I, I think that'll be fixed in, in firmware moving forward. But yes, it did actually happen to me one time. So have you had that as well? You're muted. I see you talking. Yeah, it's happened to me a few times. Uh, I now I have the latest firmware and it's happened very rarely, but it still has happened. 
Yeah, I think that over time, that's one of those things where they'll get it dialed in. And I mean, th there's some anomalies. I, I reached out to Canon, like I said, with this focus issue. I sent them raw images of images that were completely out of focus, like you could barely tell what it was. And the next image was the same bird tack sharp. So I sent yeah. them both, both and said, here's settings on both, take a look at them. And like I said, I haven't heard back yet to, to find out what was going on. But um, I, did see, I did see some anomalies for sure. But the, the good thing is that, you know, I came back with, as I, as I tell the group when I'm down there, I'm happy to get one killer shot a day. That's what I really am aiming for, which would mean I come home with nine really nice shots I'm happy with. And I actually came back with about 70. And in the presentation that I showed you those images in that grouping, there are 54 images in there. So the take rate was quite good. It doesn't mean that it was perfect. It doesn't mean that I didn't have any frustrating moments, but the take rate's really good. And I will tell you that for when I'm shooting portraits and events, the thing is dead on. Like my take rate when I shoot portrait sessions is markedly better than when I would shoot with a 5D or 1DX and back button focus with a single point. It's it's incredibly good. Like, like I said before, game changer good, so. Uh, I was taking a picture of a red-tailed hawk that was stationary, but was shifting head angles and the eye detection worked beautifully. Yeah, it, it is um, shocking how, how good it works. And I think this is where I told Canon, I said, <clears throat> for, the, for an R1, because I told him my wish list, and I said, I want even better focusing, although the eye tracking is great, I don't want the hunting, and I want it to be even faster for sports, I want two CF Express, some other things, uh, you know, bigger battery, whatever it might be. Although I will say this, the battery life where they say it's only three or 400 images easily get 1300, 1400 images out of it. So, Absolutely. right, same? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and yes, Howard, I'm in servo focus almost all the time because um, uh, I'm back button focusing and using eye tracking, if I'm using eye tracking, even when I'm not, I'm in a single point servo for wildlife and uh, almost no reason to take it out of servo focus. Um, recommendations for another lens for the R6, if you have the kit lens. For landscape, uh, I would go uh, the 15 to 35 lens, wide angle lens would be great for landscape. Um, there's 70 to 200 if you're doing any kind of events or portraiture. And then the 100 to 500, honestly, for, for wildlife, um, and for sports, again, in reasonable light is, is would be my recommendation for that. Um, so uh, Rocky wants to know, confirming I'm using electronic shutter all the time. Yes, electronic shutter, First rear, what's it called? Rear curtain electronic shutter or whatever it's called. That's what I'm using. Um, any distortion or rolling shutter? I've not seen any issues, even on the hummingbird wings. Minimal stuff, but nothing that was, ruining any images for me. So um, I, I don't like the si the fully electronic mode is completely silent and only 20 frames a second or one frame a second. So one's not enough and 20 is too much. And the, the weird thing is like you're saying, Rocky, when, when you hold the button down, you don't even know you're shooting. The frame around your, your uh, LCD or eyepiece is blinking to show you that there's images being taken but there's no feedback at all. And I'll be honest, that still freaks me out um, for two reasons. One is I, it's, it, I'm not used to like knowing if I'm shooting or not. The other thing is there were times when I'm shooting when I can listen to the shutter and go, oh wait, that was too slow. I got to up my ISO. So I, I listened for an audible cue and I'm like, oh wait, my ISO is still at 100 and I'm at a sixth of a second instead of a hundredth of a second. And I can hear that difference. And if you're in fully electronic mode, uh, it doesn't work. And oh, I see that you thought your camera was broken. Yeah, you think your camera's broken until you download and you have 7,000 <laughs> images that you took by mistake. So I don't really use the fully electronic mode unless, <clears throat> and I've done this a couple of times, if I'm in an environment that is completely silent and I want to take some images, and I've done this before, I'll use that mode. It yeah, Jeff, it's the electronic first curtain. I'm sorry? Electronic first curtain. That's what Electronic it's called. First curtain. Thank you. That's what's yeah. right. With that, I got to bug out. You guys probably have to bug out. 
It was yeah. good to have you all here. I will post this Thanks. to YouTube. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, if anybody's interested in signing up for a trip, let me know. We Africa is pretty much sold out. <clears throat> I know Botswana sold out. I think Tanzania, we may have room for one or two more. Um, in Costa Rica, I've got, like I said, February is a placeholder. December is open, and I'm going to add some more for 2022. But um, just let me know if, if you want to be on the list, and I'll, I'll throw you on there. Thanks for joining in. Good to see everybody back. Uh, I know I'm coughing, but that's just because I've been talking too much. I don't have COVID. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I hope not, because I'm about to get out of my house. So, Are you sure? Everybody, uh, good job, John. Wait. wait <laughs> Jeff Cable one. Hold on. I don't know if I showed you this. <laughs> you got it. And I had it modified even. I brought this to Costa Rica. Look at that. See? Let's see. <laughs> you know, Jeff, Jeff you have a beautiful it. smile. What's that? You have a beautiful smile. Oh, yeah. You know, you can still tell when people are smiling. Yeah. Like when I do portraits, people are like, oh, you can't tell if I'm smiling. I'm like, yes, we can. <laughs> the eyes tend to squint a little bit more. Like, you still yeah. can tell. You still yeah. can tell. Anyway, everybody have a good week. Uh, I'll try you. to get another one of these going in a couple of weeks. Oh, Read the blog. I just blogged about the tour box. This this little guy right here. It's so cool. So check out the blog. This thing is a great Christmas gift for you guys. Um, not too expensive and, and amazingly helpful. So check that out. So anyway, with that, peace out. And we'll talk. Thank to you. you. Bye, Thank guys. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.